Good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce today's talk. Um, Amelie Müller, who's a third year resident, will be talking about primary hyperparathyroidism. Yes, we will talk today about primary hyperparathyroidism, or as I will say later, PHPT. First, to understand everything, you need to understand the uh, pathophysiology. So, um, the, if the, the calcium in the blood is low, the um, parathyroid gland is stimulated, and there is an expression of PTH, of the parathyroid hormone. Uh, which activates in the bone the osteoclasts, and so there is a demineralization of the bone and there is a calcium extraction. At the same time, um, the PTH also influences the kidney by reabsorbing the calcium and therefore excreting phosphate. So then the phosphate in the serum is low and this activates uh, the vitamin D. Also, the PTH increases the uptake of the calcium in the bowel, and so all in all, we have a high calcium, and therefore, you have a negative feedback, and so the PTH, um, the parathyroid gland, um, is, has a stop until the calcium is again negative. So, if we have now a primary hyperparathyroidism, then we have an autonomy of the parathyroid gland and therefore we have a high expression of PTH without a low calcium. It has nothing anymore to do with the calcium and we have a much too high reabsorption of the calcium in the kidney. We have a, um, whole, a big bone decomposition and a, um, reabsorption of the calcium in the bowel that is also really increasing. So all in all, we have now a really high calcium. So I hope that you understood a little bit now the pathophysiology. So I want to ask um, if we now think that we have a PHPT and we do a lab. So in the serum, do you think that the PTH is high or low? In the serum, the PTH is high. Exactly. Um, do you think the calcium is high or low? High. The calcium is high. Exactly. Uh, the next one. Do you think that the... Oops, sorry. Uh, I think the phosphate is low. So the same for the urine. Do you think that the calcium is high or low? should be high from the primary. Yes. It's a little bit more difficult because normally, as we saw in the circulation before, the uh, calcium in the urine should be low. But because of the PHPT, the calcium in the serum is so high that at the end, uh, the calcium in the urine is normal or high. And last but not least, um, the phosphate in the urine, is it high or is it low? It's also um, high. Perfect. So, as you can see here, uh, we compare, in this study, they compared the incidence of uh, Northern America with Europe and the incidence there is higher than here. Uh, mostly, uh, PHPT is seen after the age of 50 and women um, are concerned three to four times uh, more than men. In our days, PHPT is discovered during routine biochemical screening um, and in countries where it's not so much routine, um, there the PHPT is more likely to be presented with uh, skeletal complications or nephrolytiasis. Um, the parathyroid gland is located at the four poles of the uh, thyroid gland, but there can be also parathyroid uh, parathyroid glands that are, uh, for example, in the mediastinum. So uh, in the PHPT, normally it's, it's a solitary adenoma in more than 80% of the cases, and more than one gland is involved in um, 10 to 15%, and we only talk about carcinoma in less than 1%. So um, if we think now that we have uh, PHPT, what, do, what should we do uh, for the diagnosis? We already said it, but I want to repeat it. Um, like you said, first uh, um, a blood test and then urine, and then we, we could do an, an imagery. Perfect. Um, it's, 
the lab and the urine because the imagery, it's, it's not wrong, but the, we will talk about this later because it's not really for the diagnosis. So we do now the, our lab and the uh, urine uh, sample again, and as you can see here where the arrows are, this is a constellation for the primary hyperparathyroidism, as we said before with the high PTH, the hypercalcemia, low phosphate in the urine, um, uh, calcium that is normal or high, and a high phosphate. But you also have to do the other uh, biochemic parameters to see if there are possible <coughs> other diagnoses, such as um, if the vitamin D um, is the uh, vitamin D deficiency, um, the PTH can also be very high. Or if the creatinine is uh, too high, you can uh, think of a kidney insufficiency, which can lead to secondary parathyroidism. About the others I will talk later. Also important is the calcium creatinine clearance in the 24-hour urine to uh, have a to differentiate if it's a primary hyperparathyroidism or FHH. I will to explain to you what an FHH is here. Um, but first of all, if we have PHBT, it can also be uh, hereditary. If uh, PHBT is, um, if a, ch a child or a young adult has PHBT, we have also always to think about man. Uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia. And we have to th think about MAN1 because MAN1 is more common with PHPT than MAN2A. MAN1 involves m multiple endocrine tumors involving the parathyroid, um, the pancreatic islet, and the duodenal cells. The MAN2A is more common with uh, medullary uh, thyroid carcinoma. Then we already talked about the vitamin D deficiency, and there is, if we have an elevated PTH, also the familiary hypocalceric hypercalcemia, the FHH, which is um, where uh, autosomal disorder uh, with a mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. But um, high PTH can also be induced by drugs such as lithium, and uh, hypercalcemia, when you have this, you also have to think about sarcoidosis, tumors, or immobility, or others. So what would you think is, are the symptoms with PHPT? Um, gastric ulcers first, then um, bone fractures or, uh, or an osteoporosis. And this, the last is a, um, a stones of the kidney then pancreatitis, diarrhea, and so on. So, as the saying goes, it's stones, bones, abdominal groans, and psychic moans. Um, the renal stones, or renal stones are a major complication, but with the regular uh, biochemical, uh, biochemical screening that we do now, the prevalence of uh, renal stones mm -hmm. Um, disease has decreased from approximately 80% to now 25-50%. Then there is the bone demineralization, which is happening because of the mobilization of the calcium uh, into the serum. Um, this is up to 20%, and there are also the peptic ulcera. Um, that uh, that's why because it's uh, the calcium absorption in the bowel is increased, and also the gastrine secretion. And there are unspecific neurological symptoms, for example, such as depression. And there is a last point, which I think it's interesting, but I didn't put it here because it's not sure and confirmed yet. yet. Um, but there, there are new studies. They show that perhaps there is a correlation between um, a really severe PHPT and an increased risk of cardiovascular uh, mortality and an increased risk of developing left ventric ventricular hypertrophy. But this has to be confirmed, so we will see in some years. So this, luckily, we don't see anymore. Um, this is the salt and pepper pattern with a bone that is really demineralized. So, 
our patient, we know now he has a PHPT. We have two possible therapies. For one, the uh, surgical approach um, and the conservative approach. Now we choose our surgical approach. First, we want to see um, who has an indication for the surgery. Um, so, of course, if the patient is symptomatic with nephrolytiasis or often broken bones or osteoporosis, then he needs surgery. But also, there are the fourth international guidelines for the management of asymptomatic PHPT, uh, which have the criteria of a confirmed PHPT plus the serum, serum calcium um, has to be 0 0.25 millimole per liters higher than the reference, or GFR under 60. I will explain you, to you this later why um, this is a criteria. criteria. Then, if in the bone density the T score is under 25, it's also a criteria, or if the age is under 50 years because um, the progression of the illness is much slower after 50 years than before. But there are also two criteria that are not in the guidelines, but I think it's also an indication uh, to operate is if in the 24-hour urine there's a calcium um, higher than 400 milligram, then you have an increased risk for kidney stones, or if there is a missing compliance for the conservative treatment of the patient. So what do you think, uh, what do you do now if you want to operate? I guess that the next step would be imaging by sonogram, for instance. Exactly. Um, this is the standard. You always do an ultrasound first, um, but you do also a scintigraphy, a sister maybe scintigraphy. And um, there is a newer possibility. It's not new, but it's new for the parathyroid gland. Normally, we use um, Cholin PET MRI. Uh, for the prostata, but now we use it all, all also for the PHPT, and we use it also here. So here you see, for one, the ultrasound is good for the morphology, and you see the sister maybe scintigraphy, which is a functional imaging uh, based on the preferential uptake of the sister maybe in the mitochondria in uh, the rich mitochondria rich parathyroid adenoma and uh, a sister maybe is quickly washed out by the thyroid gland and um, stays in the parathyroid so we take pictures after 15 minutes and 2 hours after um, the injections of sister maybe so um, here you can see that um, in those two uh, papers, the system EBCINTI has a really high sensitivity. But if the patient has a stroma multinodosa or cr chronic thyroiditis, uh, it's difficult to differentiate uh, with the adenomas. Um, the sensitivity of the ultrasound is normally around 70, but those two um, studies say it's 76 to 87 percent, it's really high, um, with a um, positive predictive value of, uh, of 93 percent. But you can um, only identify the adenomas um, that are in the positions around the thyroid. Um, other positions you can't identify, and of course, it depends on um, the examiner and his experience. Then here you have the Cholin PET CT, we use here in our house the Cholin PET MRI. Um, and in the Cholin PET, you have less false negative results. That means a higher sensitivity. And the Cholin, also the advantage of Cholin MRI, uh, it recognizes better multiple um, glandular diseases. So now again to our therapy, as we said before, we have the sur surgical approach or uh, the conservative approach, but the only creative um, option is the parathyroidectomy. So we have the minimally invasive surgery, uh, such as the open minimally 
in the minimally invasive surgery and the MIVAP, the minimally invasive video assisted parathyroidectomy and the classical open parathyroidectomy. Here, uh, those, the first two studies, um, Udelsmann and Bellatone, they compared, oh, no, they didn't compare, but they uh, wanted to look at the surgical success rate one for one in the minimal invasive surgery and the other one in the open surgery and also the morbidity. And as you can see in both studies, they have the same results. There's a third um, a paper about it. And here also you can see um, they, they had a five-year follow-up and they compared also the minimal invasive and the open surgery. And you can see that the um, calcium and the PTH, even after five years in both groups, are almost the same. Can I just quickly say, it's just to make it sure, the open surgery here, it's meant that the bilateral exposition, so the way they did it t uh, 20 years ago to expose both four glands. It's not just uh, a big cut, so it's really going for both four glands. Yeah. Yes, and then here we see the MEVAP, the minimal invasive video assisted parathyroidectomy. Uh, for this, you have to do a small cut, 1.5 to 2 centimeters, a little bit higher than the um, Koha cut. And then there you will put a 5 millimeters 30 degree optic and two other instruments. So you can imagine that it's really tight to work there. Then it's really important, or we do it uh, for sure, the intraoperatively PTH screening. Um, this is to confirm the adequate resection of the abnormal par parathyroid tissue and increases also the surgical success rate. So in the PTH, if the PTH level decreases by at least 50%, such as the um, Vienna study showed, um, and it falls down, so uh, following the resection, we know that we uh, took the, 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 the good adenomas or the, the wrong adenomas, and we don't have to explore further. Complications after the sur surgery can be, for once, the uh, paresis of the recurrent nerve, hypercalcemia you have to think about, and bleeding. The repeat surgery is necess necessary up to 5% um, of individuals with a persistent PHPT, and the persistent PHPT is defined as a development of mm -hmm. hypercalcemia uh, within in six months. A recurrent disease occurs in up to 8% in um, 3 to 11 years after the surgery, and patients with a double parathyroid adenoma have a higher rate of a recurrence than ones with a single one. So here to show you how the conservative treatment is for once, you have to go to a yearly checkup with a lab screen um, and the bone density has to be checked up every one to two years. Then you can also give vitamin D. It's always good because one third of the PHBT patients have a, um, a low vitamin D level. And uh, the most common um, conservative uh, therapy is the uh, sinazate or the Mimpara, which increases the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptors to the extracellular calcium. So there you have. Um, um, the calcium normalizes in 70 to 80 percent of the cases. So now, of course, the most important op um, question is, is the op does the operation improve the symptoms? So um, it has a decrease of the incidence of nephrolytiasis, as you can see in this study. Um, here, um, there is a 10-year follow-up where you can see that, that there is a clear decrease and uh, the stone-free survival after, there's another st a study that uh, compared patients 20 years after surgery with patients who didn't have a PHPT to see uh, if they have the same risk with, for nephrolytiasis and the stone-free survival for patients who never had a PHPT was 98% and patients after 
um, parathyroidectomy had a um, stone-free survival um, of 90%. So this is, um, explains the criteria that I told you before of the GFR under 60. And this is uh, important because um, this study and other studies showed that after a successful parathyroidectomy, um, it appears to prevent a decline of the renal function in patients who have a chronic kidney disease. And this shows um, the uh, development of the uh, skeletal problem after para parathyroidectomy, and here you can see the most important studies um, that looked um, uh, uh, of this problem, and all those studies showed that the, after parathyroidectomy, the microarchitecture um, was um, improved and also the bone density. But they showed also that there was no difference uh, in the frequency of uh, bone fractures uh, between the patient that had a parathyroidectomy and the patients that had a conservative treatment. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions left? So first, thank you very much. Very nice uh, presentation. I think this is a topic that we need to look at regularly because we don't see many of these cases, particularly those who are not uh, involved. Uh, two questions. First, do we have an idea how many, or what's the, the incidence of this disease in Switzerland? How many cases are operated in Switzerland? Or how many cases are diagnosed? My, my first question, and then more on the disease, these uh, adenomas, or this, uh, what you do discuss the risk factor, do we, there is other etiology, do we know, I mean, except just the distribution, men, women, etc., is this a virus behind that, is this uh, toxic, is that related to anything, or just mostly sporadic, but it's not sporadic because it's more in women than men, so there's mm. certainly something behind that, so what's the data, what would you speculate, so maybe we start with this uh, medical questions and then go a bit on the number of cases and mostly quality of surgery. That's what I would like to call on this. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, it's a very good question. No, it has um, nothing to do with the virus. Um, the number of indications. Um, it also has to do um, with the vitamin D. Um, but why more women are involved than men, I, I don't know. The incidence is higher in the U.S., I have seen that yes. it is in Europe. Uh, has to do with the sun, you speak about yes. vitamin D, and then you have less that, so it's basically yeah. uh, epigenetic a little bit. <clears throat> I explained it to myself because of the Northern America, and uh, here th that uh, it's because of, also because of the sun that we have more sun here. Um. But I don't think, because that would be a vitamin D deficiency would be the, the differential diagnosis so that you can correct for, and that's, you should also correct for it before you do a uh, parathyroidectomy, before you actually do the diagnosis of a PHPT. So I don't think it's done. There, are gen there must be genetic reasons, because it's also in Africa, it's even more uh, common, apparently. And then um, why it's more uh, common in women, actually, I'm not aware that we know that. And um, they, they, it's a, to give you an idea, so it's about... Um, in Germany, at least, it's about 20% of the patients with PHBT that actually get surgery. Um, then you can calculate about how many that would be if you have an incident, uh, the incidence that you showed. But I'm, I think I personally have the feeling that much less get surgery, actually. Do you have an idea how many procedures are performed in Switzerland? We are looking now for many other procedures. So we have the denominator, how many cases. Because if this is... You know, if you look now, you've seen you can minimally invasive, etc. So you go now to the competition in medicine to provide something new, etc. For quite rare disease, and if I'm the patient, I would like not to be in the five to ten percent who need redo surgery, right? And I may imagine that has certainly to do with the quality of surgery rather than the disease itself. Huh? I also think that the factor is that a lot of patients uh, don't know that they have PHPT because they. Um, if they have a regular checkup, um, also they don't have any symptoms, 
Um, and um, so. so... How many cases we operate in Switzerland, you know? No, but we will know because we have this Eurocrine data that is actually trying to get all the Swiss data too. Um, but what we can, there is a study on high versus low volume and high volume is considered 40 cases per year. And 40? 40 and more, yes. So probably there is no such center in Europe, or? Oh, well, yes, I think there is. Doing 40 cases of... Uh... I do think, because the prevalence is rather high, and if 20% of the patients that have it get surgery, I think there are, and there are centers that, uh, cent that specialize on doing the endocrine surgery. So I think that is, in Germany at least, you can, you can get that. In Switzerland, I don't think there's someone who's doing 50, 40 cases. In. There, there is some, I mean, to go, there is a literature, either from large database from the US, on others that correlate number of cases, so there are the centers, with endpoints such as recurrent disease or recurrent nerve uh, injury or anything like that? Well, in this study, uh, that, that they, they saw that these 20 cases was considered low volume. I mean, that was a head and neck uh, surgeon from the US, and 40 was considered high, and they did have a slightly higher um, um, uh, nerve injury rate in the, in the, in the low volume centers. Um, I have a question too. I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled about the 20% um, of patients that are being operated. It seems to me like the long-term consequences of this disease are, are quite significant, and yet the operation itself is not a too large one. So why are only 20% being operated? It appears like the indications for conservative management are not that um, many. That's a, that's a very good point, and it is actually a trend that more patients are getting surgery. Um, but still, it's the, uh, if you have these follow-up data, there's not real good data. There are like 15 years follow-up data of patients with asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism. And until 10 years, they, there's not much happening. And between 10 and 15 years, that's when, when something starts in, in some patients and, um, and not all. So um, and you still have the morbidity. And I think that's, that's probably the reason that not more people are getting surgery. But I agree, I would probably rather take the risk for surgery than take the risk of osteoporosis or um, nephrocosmosis. So, so the issue, what you, see, what you are telling us here, I guess, is that, is that we don't see these patients. So they are sent to the surgeons for operation. And it seems to me, maybe I'm totally wrong, that we are just a technician, hopefully good technician, uh, but uh, they are treated by, who is treating this patient? The endocrinologists, the GPs? or the Exactly, women? GPs and endocrinologists in, uh, in, in Switzerland. That's, and we get them, sometimes we get them, the, Indi the, the referrals we get from the endocrinologists, from um, the well, physicians. I'm going to be down, not to do, just the referral. I mean, this patient, mm -hmm. I mean, it's difficult to, to know that, but many probably are just treated by general practitioner. They have a nice drug, they give the drug, and they follow this patient, so... Maybe very few end up to endocrinologists, I don't know, and then few to us. I think, and I think also people might not be aware that even if you can control the calcium, um, and I think it's, it needs more awareness, even if you control the calcium, that they have a higher risk of, um, of osteoporosis and also kidney disease. So the physician might think everything is good because he's, he's treating it, he's having it under control, but it's still the disease still progresses. I think there is a... It might be more awareness for the, for the consequences. So of it's this important disease. to have a good, good website because patients go to website and they can read themselves that maybe surgery is to be considered in many more cases that, that may be offered to them. Okay. And for me, just a last thing, some very important uh, that the imaging is actually only done when we think that the indication is given because there's no use in knowing that there's a, we know there's a PHPT. If someone is not planning on doing surgery, there's no need in doing the imaging. That just uh, gives costs and it doesn't help. If we're not doing surgery, we don't need imaging. Thank you a lot uh, to the attention. <laughs>